I'm going to be talking with Mel from Sneakers Corner. Uh, I last talked to him a couple months ago. Today we're going to be looking at the origins of Christianity and those of Islam, kind of comparing and contrasting what we know about the two religions. Before we get started with that, though, why don't you give us an update on what you've been up to? I know you took a couple months off, uh, kind of did a bike tour of Europe, something like that. Yeah, so um, when was it? It was back in early July. I decided to um, fly into France and I cycled across nine countries. So if I can remember, it was France, Belgium, Luxembourg, Germany, Slovakia, Hungary, uh, Serbia, and then finally Romania. Um, it was a fantastic trip, really kind of rewarding. There was one little incident I wanted to share with you about that trip, which I thought um, kind of let me thinking about, you know, the way sometimes we can judge people and then realize actually people are really kind at heart. When I was in Serbia, uh, one morning I was in a cafe and the cafe owner said, you know, the whole world thinks we're monsters because of the war in, you know, back in the 90s. And I said, well, I, for one, know that you're really nice people. I just, I, I've, you know, I've been to Serbia before. And uh, later that day, just to prove the point, it was like 35, maybe 40 degrees. It was really hot, went for an ice cream. And I was dying to get into the shade. And uh, so I sat down outside this house. There was a kind of a seat outside and just sat down and uh, a tractor showed up, waved at the farmer and he went through the gates. And then, you know, about two minutes later, the gates open again and, and his daughter, who's about 19, 20, sort of waves me in and says, come in for food in Serbian. And I was like, oh, no, 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 it's OK. So for the next hour, I was just literally wined and dined, um, wow. just like fish, bread, cheese, snaps or snaps, is it? Um, bottle of cold beer. You can imagine when you're really warm and you you're offered a cold beer and complete strangers. And uh, and the, the mother of the house packed all this food for me to send me on my way. It was like literally the Good Samaritan there and then. Wow. It was a wonderful experience. And, uh, you know, so there, just thought I'd share that. And uh, if if you were ever in Serbia, anyone, uh, or if you don't even plan to go to Serbia, do. Really cheap country and the nicest people in the world. Without without doubt, there was no country in Europe even that came even close to them. They're just amazing people. But anyway, that was my trip in Europe. I really had a great time. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. So now that you're back into recording videos, I know that you've released a couple recent videos looking at the origins of Islam. Why don't you start out by telling us what the traditional story that just about every Muslim accepts as uh, ironclad fact? Yeah. So. The basic outline of the story is Muhammad was born around 570 AD in Mecca, now Saudi Arabia. His father died before he was born, and he was raised first by his grandfather and then his uncle. And it's said that he belonged to the Quraysh uh, tribe. Um, and they were a, a nomadic people. They were trading goods across the desert. Um, they were polytheistic and uh, they worshipped, you know, different gods. Um, Mecca was supposed to be a trading and religious center. And they believed that Abraham and Ishmael had had built the Kaaba there, but over the centuries, they eventually became polytheistic. So in his, in his teens, he worked as a camel uh, trader or camel, worked in a camel caravan, maybe put it that way traveling to Syria and so on. He earned a reputation of being honest and so on. And in his 20s, then he married Khadija, who was 40 and he was 25. Um, they had lots of children, but only Fatima survived. And Fatima was to go on to marry um, Ali, who the Shiites revere. And uh, he, Muhammad was said to be a holy person who went to sacred sites near Mecca. And then in 610, he had a religious experience where the angel Gabriel visited him. He had a small following. His wife believed him first and then Abu Bakr. And, uh, but eventually the, the Meccans kicked him out and he went to Medina, which is a city 260 miles north of there. And this all happened supposedly in 622. Um, so while he was in Medina, he, he basically licked his wounds and 
gathered an army, if you like, and uh, eventually in 630, he marched into Mecca, um, waged war on the people there, and the, most of the people converted to Islam. Um, and then the story wraps up in, in March of 632. He delivers his last sermon, and he supposedly dies on June the 8th, 632. I probably haven't included everything in the story, but that is the core part of uh, the story. Yeah. Uh, yep, so very good. So from this story, we see that Muhammad had a pretty long public career. Um, early on, he wasn't very popular. But later on, you know, he has a lot of followers. Um, he's even leading military battles, waging war against people. This is the kind of thing that you would probably expect to make it into history. Um, history books, history accounts, that kind of thing. Jesus, in contrast, uh, only spent the last three years of his life as a public figure. For the first 30 so or so years, he was basically out of sight. Uh, we know very little about his life during that time period. Probably lived an ordinary peasant life, possibly working as a carpenter. But, you know, a poor person working with his hands to make a living, basically. Uh, and by the way, a, a carpenter just is, is a builder, basically. Don't think of, like, making intricate toys for children or something like that. <laughs> think of building buildings. Yeah, yeah. For the last three years of his life, he was a public figure. He went around ancient Israel, uh, Judea, and was teaching people. He was known to work miracles, and he often had confrontations with the religious figures of his day. Then he was put to death, died an embarrassing death by crucifixion. Basically, the religious leaders got fed up with him. They charged him with blasphemy, and then they turned him over to the Romans who put him to death uh, officially for sedition, uh, leading a rebellion against the government. The crucifixion was a very humiliating death. It was the worst possible punishment that Romans could come up with. The idea was to totally uh, humiliate the person, to discourage crime, that kind of thing. Then this is normally where the story would end with any normal person. But three days later, Jesus' disciples started reporting seeing him alive again. And, uh, and then he, he appeared to them numerous times and basically said, uh, you know, I've been raised from the dead. What we can see from the story is this isn't the kind of person that would make a mark on history. Um, maybe they would, his name would be mentioned in some incidental detail in some account. But basically, history is made up of dictators, kings, military leaders, that kind of thing. Um, very rarely do peasants make it into any historical account. So we won't necessarily expect a lot of documentation for Jesus, whereas we would expect some documentation for Muhammad. Yeah. So let's start out with the Islamic side of things. Uh, what are the earliest biographical sources of Muhammad from Muslim accounts? Well, if we go by Muslim sources, um, first of all, the sources are very late. So over 120 years after his death at the very earliest, which is you know, incredibly late when we think about it. So the first source comes from the 750s to 760s. Malik ibn Anas compiles the first Hadith collection. Um, surprisingly, not mentioned very often. It's usually Al-Bukhari we often hear about, but uh, he was the, the first uh, Hadith uh, collector. And then in about 760, so if you think about that, it's 230 years, uh, let me see, uh, no, sorry, 130 years after the time of Muhammad's death, Ibn Ishaq collects biographical material and publishes the first biography of Muhammad. All I can say is the Muslims must have incredible patience with 130 years by biography. You'd imagine it'd be done much sooner than that. Um, um, 830s to the 860s, the six major Hadith collections are compiled and published. So you're talking 230 years there. Um, and surprisingly, it's like a funnel. At the beginning, there's almost nothing but Muhammad. And then towards the end or later, you know, as time goes by, it just grows and grows and grows. It's usually <laughs> the other way around. It's usually the earlier you go, you get loads of material and then things get lost and it gets smaller over time. But it's the opposite here, um, which is initially very um, suspicious. Um, there are massive doubts about the supposed transmission. Um, we have a, an early uh, 
legal scholar, Muslim scholar, who, very honest person, really, who said, I spent a year sitting with Umar, the first son, Abdallah, who died in 693, and I did not hear him transmit anything from the Prophet. And you think about it, like, that should have been the person, you know, Umar, the first son, um, second uh, caliph. Another scholar writing in 740 observes, I never heard Jabir ibn Zaid, who died in circa 720, um, say the prophet said blah, blah, blah. And yet the young men around here are saying it 20 times an hour. <laughs> you can almost tell how exasperated he is with these young men just saying, I heard him say this, I heard him say that. He can clearly knows there's something up here, you know. Um, interestingly, um, some hadiths claim or sorry, some hadiths back the claim that the Quran came together during the reign of um, Adul al-Malik as well. And some traditions record that um, Hajjaj uh, ibn Yusuf collected and edited the Quran, which would be quite late in the 690s. Um, according to one hadith, the, you remember the Malik ibn Anas? He recalled um, that reading from the Mus'af, which is the codex of the Quran, at the mosque was not done by people in the past. It was Hajaz uh, Ibn Yusuf who first instituted it. So oops. if you think, oops, <laughs> that's a big giveaway there. So literally for um, the first few decades, supposedly when it, Islam existed, they, they weren't uh, reading from this thing, according to the first hadiths, you know, so that's a big giveaway there, you know. Something else I have got here. The Umayyad court of Abdul al-Malik and those of his successors began to expand on the hadiths about Muhammad and Edison augment the Quranic text to buttress their own practices and political position. Practice that the enemies of the Umayyads, the Abbasids, skillfully employed when they supplanted the Umayyads in 750. So this became like the thing to do, you know. Words were power, you know. If you had stories, you, you could gain power if... If Muhammad said it and did it, you could say, well, then that justifies me, you know. So the interesting thing as well, um, the first real sort of sign of any sort of belief in Muhammad in terms of a rock inscription, unofficial one. Obviously, we can refer to the Dome of the Rock, but there's one from uh, 735. A little bit long, but I'll just read you uh, a little bit from it. In the name of Allah, the compassionate, the merciful Allah, forgive Hassan bin uh, Misara and his two parents and their offspring. Amen. Lord of Muhammad and Ibrahim, Allah, consider my deeds great exertion, jihad, and accept my compassion as martyrdom in your cause. And Hassan wrote it on Tuesday, the 22nd of the month of Rabib al-Awwal, in which passed away Banu Hatim, May God have mercy on all of them, and this in the year 117, which is 735. So that's the real sort of first solid reference to actually real religious belief in Muhammad and Allah as a collective, as a, as a kind of, as a religion. Islamic tradition generally identifies the second uh, Abbasid Caliph, Al-Mansur, who reigned from 754 to 775 as the first to, to, first to commission a legal manual called the Muwatta. Uh, because Islamic law is based to such a tremendous degree on the words and example of Muhammad, this manual of Islamic law records a great many hadiths of the Prophet of Islam. Um, the Imam who wrote the Muwatta, Malik ibn Anas, do you remember him? <laughs> he died a mere 16 decades after Muhammad, making him <laughs> the, the nearest in time of all the collectors of the hadiths to the life of the man whose every action and every utterance is the focus of the Hadiths. So can you see what's happening? The Hadiths were uh, written down to justify the laws. So according to a number of scholars that I've looked at, um, Robert Hoyland and uh, Robert Spencer, the idea that they convey is that the early Muslims, uh, when they set up their, um, their reign, all they did was they inherited laws from earlier times, and then they had to Islam, Islamize it. So one way of doing that was to say, well, Muhammad did this and Muhammad did that and said this and said that. And so that was the way to kind of give it a flavor that was Islamic. But once those hadiths were started, then it became a useful tool between the Umayyads and Abbasids 
to um, gain power. So they they use them as a way of saying we are more entitled to be leader than you are. You know, so that's mm -hmm. that's a lot of what went on. The early Islamic scholar Muhammad ibn Shahab Az Zuri, who died in 741, 60 years before the death of Malik ibn Anas, complained even in his day that the emirs force people to write hadiths. Force them, right? <laughs> it's a bit like you know if you're um, if you're captured and you're you're for, you're tortured to make um, a confession and you're like I don't know anything, and they start electrocuting you. You start you start coming up with stuff. Well, it seems to be like that, that, you know, people were very good at uh, putting together stories, you know, and if they needed to produce them, they, they would, would do so. And, of course, um, a pure sign that these things were met up is that um, some of the hadiths that were collected side by side contradict each other, you know, like literally one under the other contradicts the earlier one. So um, there wasn't much thought about uh, that you know, it just it was thrown together and it it served its, its function. So uh, yeah, so that's the Muslim tradition at least. Uh, very good. So uh, we have this rock inscription. I guess is the earliest, about a hundred years after Muhammad's death. Then we got Ibn Ishaq's biography, which is about 125 years. Uh, but Muslims don't even accept that as an authentic source. Um, because they don't like some of the content in it. They say that it's uh, not very accurate. It doesn't portray Muhammad accurately. So they rely pretty much exclusively on the Hadith material that was written down 200 or more years after Muhammad's death. And of course, that, that material has been massaged over the years, you know, even out, you know. Absolutely. So in contrast, um, our earliest biographies of Jesus are what we call the four canonical Gospels. All scholars, whether they're Christians, atheists, skeptical, whatever, everyone basically agrees they're written within the first century, which means within 70 years of Jesus' death. I see a lot of times Muslims make the mistake of thinking Jesus died in the year zero. Uh, that's mm -hmm. not accurate. <laughs> he died yeah. either in uh, 30 or 33, depending on how you look at the evidence. So, uh, and that would be the last of the Gospels. Even the most skeptical critics pretty much agree that the early Gospels were written in no later than the late 60s. Uh, so yeah. that would be about 30 years after Jesus. Personally, I take a look at uh, the ending of the book of Acts, which was written by Luke. It ends rather abruptly with Paul on trial. Uh, there's no resolution to the story. And it doesn't cover some really important events that we know occurred in the year 62, which suggests to me the most logical explanation is that the work was written about the year 61. The, you know, the ending is just really abrupt. He doesn't cover, not only doesn't he cover what happened to Paul, he doesn't cover the, the death of James, who was the really important leader in the early church. Uh, James was martyred in the year 62. So that's probably about when... Acts was written, which means that probably Luke was written around the same time period, maybe a year or two years earlier, uh, since Acts says, in my former work, which is Luke. And Luke records in his prologue that he relied on earlier sources. I'm just going to read a couple lines of that. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you. Critical scholars um, agree that the Gospels probably depend on earlier material. So really we're talking about biographical material that was written down no later than a decade or two after the time of Jesus. And of course, was passed on orally before that time. The Gospels contain a lot of detail about Jesus. Uh, if you take the four together, they're nearly as long as the entire Quran, um, which doesn't contain basically any information about Muhammad. Uh, so we have a lot of information about uh, Jesus. Furthermore, there's a lot of incidental details in the accounts. There's a lot of names of characters that don't do anything. They're just names that, you know, and so it's so it was also present, that kind of thing. Uh, they show intimate familiarity with the geogra geography of the region. 
There are indications in them that they're familiar with things that were we know were destroyed when uh, Rome destroyed Jerusalem in the Roman War. That would be the year 70. So they show a very close connection with the subject. So overall, we can see that the biographical material for Jesus is much earlier than the Hadith collections that Muslims rely upon. It's also much earlier than the histories which they claim are inaccurate. Uh, it's found in cohesive narr narratives. It's not a bunch of alleged quotes um, remembered by a bunch of different people and all pieced together in a Hadith collection, which then Muslims have to take a look at and go through and say, okay, Muhammad said all these things. Let's try to figure out when he said them, come up with some order for his life. You know, skeptics uh, often say that they, in order to believe in God, they require extraordinary evidence that, you know, normal historical evidence is insufficient. Well, first of all, this isn't really a valid thing to say, epistemology, because every event in history is unique. So by definition, every event is extraordinary. But even if we ignore that fact, I personally would say that having four biographies of a peasant teacher who died a dishonorable death is quite an extraordinary piece of evidence. Yeah, we don't even have multiple biographies of most of the ancient rulers, let alone, you know, peasant teachers. Now, Muslims might say, wait a minute, you've only talked about uh, the Hadith and the histories, the Sirah. But what about the Quran? Surely the Quran comes from the time of Muhammad. Uh, let, let's ignore the problem with dating the Quran for the moment. What does it tell us about Muhammad? Um, well, it tells us surprisingly little about Muhammad. It actually only mentions him five times. And one of the times it calls him um, Ahmad. Um, so most of the references are to a prophet, to a messenger, a warner. But it's it's five times for for a holy person who's connected with a book is, is incredibly few times. If you think about it, I think Peter is mentioned in one of the Gospels about... 33 times or something. I think that's figures uh, six to my mind. I think it might be Mark's gospel. Um, if anyone can correct me, you know, uh, comment down below. Um, <laughs> but, you know, for for a Quran, you'd imagine Muhammad would be mentioned a lot more than that. Um, yeah, so not a lot, not a lot in the Quran, uh, not a lot of biographical detail. In fact, it's almost nothing. Yeah, yeah absolutely. The you know, if you read an English translation, it's going to say, oh, Muhammad this, oh, Muhammad that. But it's not actually in the Arabic, which is why they put it in parentheses, because it's the translator telling you that this is about Muhammad. But the text yeah. doesn't say that. Yeah. And uh, I, I mean, it, there's no reason to say that that name wasn't just read back into an existing tradition about some other person. I mean, there's nothing objectively to say that uh, when you look at it just on a surface level. Especially when it, it occurs so rarely. If if it occurred right through the text, then you might be persuaded to think it was there in a, originally. But when it only appears a handful of times, it's very suspicious. Right. I mean, we, we got yeah, there's 114 surahs, and you know, five at best five six mentions of Muhammad. That means most of the surahs don't mention him at all, yeah. and they're and all the material. It's not like it's one continuous narrative. It's all. You know, there's a few lines about something and then it just goes to some other subject. So there's nothing to connect them together naturally and say that these are all about the same person. Yeah. So okay. let's now turn to the, the non-Islamic sources. I know this is what you've been eager to talk about because this is what you've been digging into lately. And you've uncovered some really interesting material in this area. Yeah. So what have you found? Yeah, well, it's, it's taken quite a long time to kind of piece it all together, but um, for Muslims watching, there's good news and there's bad news. So the good news is that there was a real Muhammad. That's the good news. The bad news is that the early sources contradict in a lot of ways the later Muslim accounts. So um, what I think, before I go into some of the sources, what I think was happening is they have projected a biography back on a historical figure called Muhammad. Um, and he was um, very little like th their idea they have in their minds. It's um, it, he could have been anyone. Um, but anyway, let's get stuck into some of the sources. 
So we'll start with um, an 8th century um, British Library edition. Um, it's called 14643. Um, it's an early date. It's 947, uh, the year of the Greeks, um, which is 635 to 636 uh, CE. It says on Friday, the 4th of February, um, which will be 634 CE, at the ninth hour, there was a battle between the Romans and the Arabs of Muhammad, which in Syriac is Tayaye de Muhammad in Palestine, 12 miles east of Gaza. The Romans fled, leaving behind the patrician, Bryden, whom the Arabs killed. Some 4,000 poor villagers of Palestine were killed there. Christian Jews and Samaritans. The Arabs ravaged the whole region. Um, before we go into the next one, um, oh, I wanted to say something there. Let me just uh, re recollect. Um, yes, the year, 634, right? Um, according to Islamic tradition, um, he should have been dead and buried two years before that. But here in this earliest account that we have, or one of the earliest accounts, he's alive and well and, and <laughs> waging war and killing people. Well, supposedly, you know, dead. <laughs> so that just, you know, if Muslims can't even get the date of his, uh, of his deaths right, uh, how much of the rest of the biography can be trusted? So we take another example. Um, this is from AG 947. So this is about, uh, well, it's, it's recorded as, maybe I've got the year wrong, but 635 to 636. The Arabs invaded the whole of Syria and went down to Persia and conquered it. The Arabs climbed uh, the mountain of Mardin and killed many monks there in the monasteries of Kidar and Binotto. There died the blessed man Simon, doorkeeper of Kedar, brother of Thomas the priest. So you have a group of monks not bothering anyone and uh, they invade the place and just kill the monks for just div divilment. Not very nice. So there was the peaceful Islam at the beginning. <laughs> now, you can tell from those, um, there's not any mention of uh, the Quran, there's not mention of Islam. Um, they're referred to as Tayaye of Muhammad. Now, Tayaye is a particular word which um, it means the nomads of Muhammad. And these uh, would have been, um, you know, there, in Arabia at the time, there were two groups of people, nomads and the settled people. And the, the ones who were more inclined to go fighting would be the nomads. Probably a lot of these had been working as auxiliaries for either the Byzantians or the Sassanians prior to this. So they weren't just, um, you know, carpenters or, or farmers or that. They, these were so, proper soldiers that um, took advantage of the situation to go on, on a raiding um, mission, you know. So um, to give you some other examples. There is a reference recording the Arab conquest of Syria known as fragment on the Arab conquests that mentions Muhammad. It's folio one of the British Library edition 14461, a codex containing the gospel according to Matthew and the gospel according to Mark. So this is a note that was penned inside the covers of the gospel. Um, and it was penned soon after the Battle of Gabata in 636 um, CE, at which the Arabs inflicted crushing defeat of the Byzantines. Um, so from the, the fragment, dot, dot, dot. And in January, they took the, the word of uh, further lives, did the sons of Emesa, i.e. Hems, and many villages were ruined with killing by the Arabs of Muhammad. And a great number of people were killed and captives were taken from Galilee as far as Beth, dot, dot, dot. Um, I should say that some of the, some of the writing can't uh, be read. So there, is, there are a few gaps. And those Arabs pitched camp beside Damascus, and we saw everywhere an olive oil which they brought and them. And on the 26th of May went uh, Sacalarius, dot, 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 cattle, dot, 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 from the vicinity of Emesa, and the Romans chased them, dot, dot, dot. And on the 10th of August, the Romans fled from the vicinity of Damascus, dot, dot, dot. Many people, some 10,000, dot, dot, dot. And at the turn of the year, the Romans came. And on the 20th of August in the year 947, they're gathered in Gabata, dot, dot, dot. The Romans and great many people were killed of the Romans, some 50,000. So that's quite an early reference to the battles. 
Um, an interesting one um, later in the century well, is from Savius, who was an Armenian bishop, and he was writing in the 660s. You're talking about 30-something years later. Um, so he's he gives us the earliest sort of beginnings of a biography of Muhammad. So it's quite interesting. At that time, a certain man from along those same sons of Ishmael, whose name was Mahmud, i.e. Muhammad, a merchant, as if by God's command, appeared to them as a preacher and the path of truth. He taught them to recognize the God of Abraham, especially because he was learnt and informed in the history of Moses. Now, because the command was from on high, at a single order, they came together in unity of religion. Abandoning their vain cults, they turned to the living God who had appeared to their father, Abraham. So Mahmed legislated for them not to eat carrion, not to drink wine, not to speak falsely and not to engage in fornication. He said, with an oath, God promised this land to Abraham and his seed after him forever. And he brought about as he promised during that time while he loved Ishmael. But now you are the sons of Abraham and God is accomplishing his promise to Abraham and his seed for you. Love sincerely only the God of Abraham and go and seize the land which God gave to your father Abraham. No one will be able to resist you in battle because God is with you. Now, there are some details which connect with later biographies, like, for example, there's a reference to him being a preacher, a merchant. Um, there's a reference to his name. Um, but clearly here, there's no reference to a new religion. There's no sense in which there is a new message here. He's just basically parroting the Jewish faith. It's he's basically just drawing from the Old Testament. Um, it suggests that he's an expert on Moses. So this is not an illiterate guy. This is a guy who's, you know, reasonably well read. Um, and he's talking about loving God of the God of Abraham. So this is not the this is not the Allah worship that we, we get later on. This is something that we'd be very comfortable with. You know, um, this is within the Judeo Christian very easily. You know, um, what we mightn't be too happy about is all the the fighting and killing but that wasn't entirely unusual for the time um, so i'll give you another um source um it's from uh, a document called doctrina jacobi this is a greek anti-jewish uh, tract spawned by the Her heraclean persecution it is cast in the form of a dialogue between jews set in Carthage in the year um, 634 now it's believed to be written about 640 so it's very early uh, at one point in the argument, reference is made to current events in Palestine in the form of a letter from a certain Abraham, a Palestinian Jew. OK, so it's sort of a fiction, but it's based it's kind of based in the context of real events that have happened recently. So here it goes. It says a false prophet has appeared among the Saracens. They say that the prophet has appeared coming with the Saracens and he's proclaiming the advent of the anointed one who is to come. I, Abraham, went off to Psychamina and referred the matter to an old man very well versed in the scripture. I asked him, what is your view, master and teacher, of the prophet who has appeared among the Saracens? He replied, groaning mightily, he's an imposter. Do the prophets come with sword and chariot? Truly, these happenings today are works of disorder. Would you go off, Master Abraham, and find out about the prophet who has appeared? So I, Abraham, made inquiries and was told by those who had met him. There is no truth to be found in the so-called prophet, only bloodshed, for he says he has the keys of paradise, which is incredible. There's so much in that that contradicts um, later accounts. First of all, um, in this reference, Muhammad is, is not the main act. He's just a warm-up act. He's preparing the way for someone who's going to follow him, the anointed one. So he's clearly ripping off from the gospel. Um, he thinks he's John the Baptist. Um, the other thing, uh, let me see, the... The reaction from the people is he's totally not credible. They don't even think he's remotely credible. Um, and there's also um, a reference. He says he has the keys of paradise. That doesn't appear anywhere in the Quran or any of the Hadiths. But this is one of the earliest things that is Muhammad was going around saying that we can actually say it's historically accurate. Um, keys of paradise. If I say keys of heaven, who would you think of? Who has the keys of heaven in the Gospels? Uh, that would be Peter. <laughs> yeah. So he's um, he's like a, he's trying to be an amalgamation of John the Baptist and uh, Saint Peter. So 
clearly he's a bit loony. He's a religious fanatic, but he's he's borrowing heavily from Jewish traditions and Christian traditions. Um, but it's not working. You know, the Christians aren't buying it. They think he's just an imposter. Um, so to give you one more source, um, this is from 690 from a guy called John Bar Pinkaye, and he was a monk. Now, I'll just cut straight to the ch chase. He talks about um, Mua Muawaya, first of all, but then he goes on. He says, they had received, as I said, from the man who was their guide, an order in favor of the Christians and monks. Similarly, because of his guidance, they held to the worship of one God, according to the customs of the old law. Firstly, they were so attached to the, the tradition of Muhammad, who was their leader, that they inflicted the death penalty on anyone who seemed not to obey his commands. Their troops went every year into distant countries and islands, raided and brought back captives from all nations that were under heaven. It says that he, he held to the worship of one God and according to the customs of the old law. Now, I would interpret that as the Jewish law. So what we find here is there's nothing new here. It's the Jewish law and uh, it's, um, it's war and pillage and plunder. And that's fundamentally the message of Muhammad. Um, there is a contradiction between his account and earlier accounts. Here he's um, he's saying that he had an order in favour of the Christian and monks, but as we can see from the earlier account, he had no problem having the monks killed. So it's kind of hard to read what is actually going on. Is is the, the impression that he's nice to the monks, is this propaganda, but the reality is that he was killing monks? I, It's hard to know. It's, it's very confusing, but the, the key thing is I'm not getting the impression of Islam at this stage. I'm just getting the impression of someone who is um, a, a guy who's who's been listening to Christians and Jews and has and basically parroted their message. So that's that, those are some of the the main sources there. Oh, very interesting. Uh, so earlier I said that um, if Muhammad was a military uh, dictator or a general or whatever you want to call him, then we'd expect to find some evidence of that, and indeed that's what we do have. The weird part here is that we don't have any Islamic sources. You know, normally the victor would be the one who wants to write up an account. Yes, the people who are defeated do write accounts, but the victor always writes account. They always brag about their accomplishments, that sort of thing. So this is kind of weird. And I know we'll get back to the, this when we um, talk about what we think really happened with Islam, why there's no record. No, um, records that sort of survive today about this period from Islam or the so-called Islam side of things. But what you do see from these accounts um, is that there was someone named Muhammad. He did go around conquering people. It looks like he used a, a religious message to motivate people. He said, you know, you guys are the promised seed of Abraham. Um, so you, you're getting to be strong in battle, that sort of thing. But it doesn't sound like these accounts are all that compatible with the Islamic version of events that were created much later. Um, there's no mention of a new book. There's no mention of him getting revelation. It says that he learned the traditions of Moses. It doesn't say that he received revelation. And some of these accounts are pretty extensive about what Muhammad was teaching. And it, was, it sounds basically like he thought he was a prophet of Judaism. Yeah. Uh, what do you what are your conclusions? Yeah, well, I I've looked for any reference to Islam or Muslims in all of the sources I could get hold of. And I've looked through lots of different books. There is no mention of the word Muslims or Islam till the 690s. None. The only words that are used for for the Arabs are Tiyaye, which you mentioned earlier on, the Hagarenes and the Saracens. And Ishmaelites would be another one. But um, there's no mention of Muslims. So uh, without giving too much away of later, I, I think the, the key to figuring out how Islam began, we, we need to look into the 690s. That's, that's the key period when the Umayyads were ruling, where Islam seemed to have come out of the cupboard. You know, but Islam is, is essentially invisible to the, until that point. Oh, very good. So when we look at Christianity, um, like Islam, we have some extra biblical accounts written by a, people who are more or less hostile to the Christians. Um, we have many brief fragments 
but I'm just going to focus on the two most important pieces of data. The first is from the Roman historian Tacitus. He's writing about the famous Roman fire that occurred under Nero, and he's talking about how Nero wanted to, there was a rumor going around that Nero himself had started the fires and he wanted to um, squash that rumor. Uh, so Tessus writes, consequently, to get rid of the report, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. Christus, from whom the name had its origins, suffered the extreme penalty under the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate, and a most mischievous superstition thus checked for the moment again broke out, not only in Judea, the first source of evil, but even in Rome, where all things hideous and shameful from every part of the world find their center and become popular. So there's a number of things to note about this. First of all, um, the scholarly consensus is very strong that this is a legitimate, independent account. You know, the language used is extremely hostile to Christians. This isn't something that a Christian would have made up and written back into Tacitus' account centuries later. You know, he calls them the the mischievous superstition and he says hated for their abominations that kind of thing and then when he goes on uh, after the part that i quoted he describes the all the punishments that nero inflicted on him and he's like you know, he fed them to wild animals and he lit them on fire and you know all these things it's not the kind of thing that a, a christian would be making up so basically every every scholar agrees that this is a, a independent source of information and it tells us a few really important details. It confirms that Jesus Christ was the founder of Christianity. It confirms that he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. And it confirms that Christianity should have died out, but for some unknown reason, exploded after the death of Jesus. This is an Antastus account, but putting together uh, other historical accounts, we know that in the 40s, a riot broke out in Rome, and they kicked out all the, the Jewish people from Rome um, because and blamed it on uh, people making trouble about uh, Christus again. So, you know, by the year four, in the, in the 40s already, there was a large population of Christianity in, within Rome, and this is, you know, hundreds of miles away from uh, Judea. And then after that, Another 20 years later, there's again a, a large enough population that Nero can try to pin the blame for his troubles on this population. So we see that you know Christianity is growing very quickly. Um, see just, that... just to interrupt you for a second, it's, it's interesting there. It contradicts some claims I've heard recently that the Romans concocted Christianity. Like the Romans were <laughs> hostile from the beginning. They tried their very best to, to um, kill off Christianity, and yet to, to claim that they started it. It's the most ludicrous claim ever, you know? Yeah. It, it, this is like the the most popular claim of internet conspiracy theorists that and, and it, it's always the Council of Nicaea and it's always Constantine. Or, you know, it's one of the two or both combined that form that founded Christianity in the the year three hundred and twenty three. Yeah. It's like, they latch on no, to no. <laughs> they latch on to a couple of facts. They have no clue about history, and they and they build a whole conspiracy on it. That's all they need. Just one or two facts, and away they go. Yeah. Anyway, sorry you know, to interrupt you. <laughs> nope. And, and you know, and they ignore the dozens and dozens of sources that were written before that time by both Christians and uh, non-Christians that talk about this horrible new religion uh, in very hostile terms. Yeah. So our, our second major source non-Christian source for the life of Jesus is from Josephus. He was a Jewish historian who wrote in the first century. Um, he mentions Jesus twice in his account of Jewish history. And I will just read, I'll first read the version of one of those accounts as it comes down to us, and then I'll talk a little bit more about it. About this time lived Jesus, a wise man, if indeed one ought to call him a man. For he was the achiever of extraordinary deeds and was a teacher of those who accept the truth gladly. He won over many Jews and many of the Greeks, and he was the Messiah. When he was indicted by the principal men among us and Pilate condemned him to be crucified, those who had come to love him originally did not cease to do so. For he appeared 
to them on the third day, restored to life, as the prophets of the deity had foretold these and countless other marvelous things about him. And the tribe of Christians, so named after him, has not disappeared to this day. Now, historians have looked at this and they said, you know, th this is too good to be true. This couldn't be written by uh, a first century faithful Jewish person. Uh, but they're pretty much in unanimous agreement that it wasn't just a made up account, but rather that Christians had changed a few select words where he, he maybe said things that they didn't agree with and uh, made the account better than it was. Scholars reconstructed the original text based on, you know, a, a really technical reading of the Greek and and what they thought that Josephus would actually say. Um, and then in 1972, we discovered an, an older version or alternate. I'm not 100 percent sure that it's older, but an alternate version of the text um, mm. preserved in the writings of Agapius. Well, and I he writes, heard that. he writes, at this time, there was a wise man called Jesus and his conduct was good and he was known to be virtuous. Many people among the Jews and other nations became his disciples. Pilate condemned him to be crucified and to die. But those who had become his disciples did not abandon his discipleship. They reported that he had appeared to them three days after his crucifixion and was alive. Accordingly, he was perhaps the Messiah concerning whom the prophets have reported wonders. And the tribe of Christians, so named after him, has not disappeared to this day. That to We're, me sounds very credible. Yes. So this yeah. version um, is very close to what scholars guessed the original text might be already. And, you know, the, there's a number of things you notice here, like he removes or it doesn't have the phrase, if indeed he was a man, it just says he was a man. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't say that he was reported live on the third day, he says, or I mean, it says he was reported live on the third day instead of he was found alive on the third day. Yeah. yeah uh, it yeah. says he was perhaps the Messiah instead of he was the Messiah. Yeah. Yeah. So, so this is something that a faithful Jew who did not convert to Christianity could write. It basically is just reporting what happened. You know, yeah. there was a man, he did some, he was thought to work miracles. He won a lot of over and then he was put to death. And then people thought they saw him alive again. So it's very credible. It's what, a, you know, a, a first century Jew could write who was just trying to record accurate history. Um, but it does contain all, even the, the second version that's more likely to be the original does contain pretty much all the core details of the story. Absolutely. Um, it, it says that Jesus was a good teacher. It says that he was put to death under Pilate. It says that people reported seeing him alive again and that they thought he was the Messiah. And it says that he was the founder of the Christians. So while these two accounts aren't obviously aren't as extensive as the Gospels, what they do say lines up with the Gospels, whereas when we looked at the Islamic material, it didn't really line up right. Uh, I mean, we wouldn't expect it to have as much information in either case, but we would expect that what it does say can be lined up. And nor would we expect these writers, you know, to be spending a lot of time talking about uh, some guy named Jesus who they thought was who had founded a false religion. They're not going to be they're like, oh, yeah, that great Jesus guy. Let's write pages and pages about this guy who we hate. Yeah. yeah. So what about uh, early Muslim leaders or should, uh, perhaps I should say Arab leaders, since we don't really uh, have any evidence they're Muslim? Yeah. So the first Arab ruler whose name is attested on coins or inscriptions document, um, as well as contemporary chronicles, is Muawaya the founder of the Umayyad dynasty, which is from 661 to 750, that's the Umayyad dynasty. It's surprising the first caliphs, first four caliphs are not mentioned in anything. There's a good reason for that. It's probably they're too um, caught up in just waging war and killing lots of people and uh, fighting among themselves um, to be bothered about things like that. But it, under Muawiyah, it was a kind of a period of peace uh, under his reign, at least for part of it. So he could get back to sort of normal sort of things like minting coins and so on. Ziad Muawiyah's viceroy over all the eastern churches was also the first to add religious slogans in Arabic to the coinage. This is from 670 to 674. So it's quite late, so it's 40 years afterwards. Um, inscribing the phrase, in the name of God, my Lord, uh, Bismillah Rabbi, 
a rabbi. Nothing particularly Islamic. Uh, a Christian could easily say that. Um, that word rabbi is um, is a, a Syriac word as well as an Arabic word and uh, is used for a teacher and so on. Still a far cry from a clearly recognizable Islamic slogan 40 years after the time of Muhammad. I think that's the key thing there. On coins and official documents, Muawaya only ever used the title servant of God and commander of the faithful um, and referred to his rule as the jurisdiction of the faithful, uh, Kada al Mu uh, Minin. Um, so nothing particularly Islamic about that. Um, in the 640s and 650s, uh, there was a co coin in Palestine which bears the inscription Muhammad, but depicts a figure holding a cross. So major contradiction there. So who is this Muhammad guy, the cross holder? You know, who's to say maybe Muhammad was big into Christianity, who knows? But it's surprising, like 640s, that's like just... 10 years or so, uh, 15 years after Simon Muhammad, and he's depicted uh, holding a cross. If you think about how the Quran is so anti the cross, it's bizarre when you think about it. So it, it contradicts things. Um, the 660s, 670s, there's a coin depicting Muawiyah holding a cross, but here it's topped with a crescent. So you kind of see a gradual transition, if you like, at that stage. Uh, in the 680s, there's coins apparently depicting Yazid featuring a cross. So they're really fond of the crosses um, right up to the 680s. Um, now, there may be good reason for that. Um, it's probably a sign that most of the population were still Christians. And the Arabs, whatever they are, they're not, they're not all Christians. Or sorry, they're not. There's a minority of them which are non-Christians, let's say, in the in the in the uh, in the kingdom, if you like. Now it's in 685 that things turn. Abdullah ibn Az Zubair, he's the rebel ruler of Arabia, Iraq, and Iran. He mints some some coins proclaiming Muhammad as the prophet of Allah. So he's the one that really just pulls this one out of a bag somewhere, you know. And then we get 691. The Dome of the Rock has an inscription declaring Muhammad as a servant of God and his messenger, and that the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, was only a messenger of God and features an amalgamation of Quranic uh, quotes. So you can see that suddenly they've gone from almost no mention of Muhammad to suddenly he, he is the, the counter figure to Jesus. Um, and they, they build the Dome of the Rock across the way from the Church of the Sepulchre. So it's kind of, it's a political statement as well. You know, they are, they've conquered the Byzantines. They are, you know, they are the rulers now and their religion is better than Christian. So there's a really strong anti-Christian flavor in the 690s that doesn't seem to be there in the early days in the Arabs. 696, the first coins appear that do not feature an image of the sovereign um, and do feature the Islamic confession of faith, the Shahada. It's interesting that uh, if we believe Muslims existed prior to this, they didn't seem to have a problem with images on coins until 696. <laughs> 60 years, no problem. But if you were to read the Hadith and believe it, Muhammad was a, 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 a iconoclastic back in the day. He wouldn't, you wouldn't think it, you know. Um, the coins don't lie, you know. It tells, tells us a lot. I'd also just mention that uh, in the 690s, according to Islamic tradition, Hejaz bin Yusuf is said to have introduced uh, mosque worship, sorry, introduced into the mosque worship the practice of reading from the Quran, which I mentioned earlier on. So this is the same period. And he is also meant to have added the diacritical marks to the text of the Quran. And uh, yeah, and then in the seven. In 730, the Christian writer John of Damascus refers to Islamic theology in detail and to surahs of the Quran, although not to the Quran by name. So from his understanding, these surahs are like separate books. So he doesn't convey the idea that these are one book, but books of Muhammad. So that's a bit weird. So big mystery. There's a lot of things to be worked out, you know. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think uh, a couple things come to my hair. One, 
well, what we see from the coinage and such doesn't contradict what we saw in the non-Islamic sources, that um, there's nothing odd about the coins having uh, Christian symbolism on them from what we read in the other accounts, because the other accounts seemed like this mostly wasn't a religious movement. It was mostly uh, unite the Arabs for military purposes movement. So it makes perfect sense that the, you know, these early Muslim or not really Muslim, but these Arab rulers that are now called Muslims would be featuring images of that of their subjects on their coins. Uh, you know, whether they were Christians themselves or not doesn't really matter. They're clearly not hostile to Christianity. And but that, it is just, really. Yeah. Sorry to go ahead. You. I was just going to say that it's clear from many of the sources that. The Christians of that time were quite happy to join the conquest with the other Arabs. So clearly they didn't see anything that was um, against their faith among the other Arabs. Um, and they were able to, you know, they were willing to fight alongside and, uh, you know, bring about this new kingdom. So that's that requires an awful lot of explaining from Muslims to explain why would Christians join an Islamic group? you know, fighting for expansion if, if there was an Islamic group at that time. Yeah, absolutely. So all this evidence is more or less compatible with what we see in the um, non-Islamic sources, and none of it's basically compatible with what we read in later Islamic so-called history. Uh, it's funny that David Wood has a video that says, I believe in, that's called I Believe in Muhammad. Basically, it's its purpose is to make fun of the idea that that Muslims say, I believe in Jesus, uh, but Paul came and corrupted Christianity. So he yeah. says, I, I believe in Muhammad. The original Muhammad uh, was a follower of Jesus. He was a faithful Christian. <laughs> and then later uh, people came along and they changed his message. And he, he paints it on Uthman, of course, because of the story of Uthman uh, gathering the Quranic materials together and burning all the variants he didn't like. But, uh, you know, I mean, it's intended as a joke, but in a way, it it's, seems like it might have some truth in it, that the, the original Muhammad wasn't anti-Christian. He, I mean, he he was a, clearly not the greatest guy in the world that, you know, he's leading these military raids, but he's not, religiously, he's not doing anything all that offensive to Christian beliefs. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so far we've seen that there's not much evidence uh, that these so-called Muslims were following Islam or that Muhammad taught anything all that unique. Um, but what about the Quran? Because surely the Quran existed at this point. Um, well, from my studies, I, I can't see any evidence of the Quran existing prior to the 690s. Now, there may be something earlier than that, which might be uh, the sources from which the Quran was constructed. These might have been Christian texts that were edited and, and Islamized and so on. I got this note from uh, Jay Smith, because this area is not an area that I'm, I have studied that much in at this stage. It's something I, I, I plan to in, over the coming months. But he said both the um, Ma'il and the Samarkand manuscripts only go up to Surah 43, but they are missing some of the surahs within that number as well. And he says that the Petropolitanus is only 20%, 26% of the Quran, and the Sana has only bits and pieces of the Quran, with the lower layer only 70 verses in length. So that's quite a lot. Um, and uh, anyone who has been watching Jay Smith's recent videos will know how much editing has been going on in the early manuscripts. Um, we can understand a few corrections here and there, but whole lines have been deleted you know, certain passages covered over and new new passages written on top, uh, multiple insertions of Allah where there was no Allah there. It's It looks very fishy, you know. And these are the earliest Qurans, you know. Yeah. Um, so I have a, a couple of thoughts to add. Um, with those two Quran, early Qurans only going to Surah 43, I thought that that was very weird that they would both end in the same place. I, mean, I would understand if part of the manuscript was lost. That's not weird. 
but then both having most of the text from Sura 1 to Sura 43 and ending at the same part, to me, suggests that there's a good possibility that's where the Quran actually ended at that point. Yeah. And then if you look at, at the some of the other more fragmentary manuscripts, you see that what they tend to always preserve is the stories that we know existed before the time of Muhammad, that we have other accounts of these same stories, obviously not word for word identical, um, stories were mostly passed down orally, so each written account is a little different, but they're the, the material that we know the stories already existed. So there's no reason to believe that just because we have a text of that account that's written on something that is claimed to be a Quran, it was actually considered a Quran by the people using it. Yeah. Um, there's something else I want to mention, which I've, I've referred to in an earlier video, which is there is a reference to the Qibla change, you, you know, um, the Qibla change from Petra to Mecca, according to archaeological evidence. And this, the first mosque pointing to Mecca would have been in 725. But what we find is in some of the earliest Qurans, there is no mention of Surah 243 to 247, which is the key reference to the Qibla change. And the other thing it, it, um, that's of relevance is the fact that it doesn't mention where the Qibla originally pointed to. It only says that it was changed to the sacred mosque. And it's later hadiths, 200 years later, that fills in the picture and says, well, it originally pointed to Jerusalem and then it pointed to Mecca and so on. And this all happened during the time of Muhammad. But the archaeological evidence doesn't back that up. It says that the, the Qibla change happened over 70 years after the time of Muhammad. So that's like a major bit of fraud or uh, uh, what's the word for it? Fraud. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Um, so I know what every Muslim who has some education in this area is probably thinking right now. Uh, what about the, the carbon dating? They've carbon dated Qurans. They, we know that those Qurans came from within a few years of Muhammad because of the carbon dating. So what do you say about that? Yeah, carbon dating is uh, is often given an awful lot more credibility than it actually deserves because all the carbon dating does is it, it tells you the age of the material on which the writing was put, but it doesn't tell you when the writing was actually applied to the material. So, for example, I could easily get an old document from 200 years ago. I write on it and uh, send it away for carbon uh, testing and they will say, oh, it was written back in the 1800s or whatever. So, you know, there's a good chance that people didn't just use um, new vellum or new parchment to, to, to write on. They might have used old documents and just wiped them off and wrote on them. And actually, that's the evidence that Jay Smith and others are pointing out to in those early Qurans. There's loads of evidence of wiping out on old, old material and writing over them. So the carbon dating is flawed in that, in that score. There's also another problem, which is contamination. So any contact uh, that the material has with other materials can can screw up the, the dating. If we take the example of the Turin Shroud, which is said to have been the Shroud wrap, wrapping Jesus, one of the carbon tests that was done gave a year of 1300. But after they had done the test, they found that there was actually a new piece of cloth that was added to the original that was entered with the old cloth and that's that actually brought up the year to you know much later than than it would, might have been otherwise but they haven't done a later carbon dating test on it but that's just an example of the potential flaws you know anything can uh, contaminate the, these parchments it doesn't take much yeah and people have this idea that you just put a sample into a machine and it gives you a date uh, that's not really how it works at all the rate of uh, carbon-14 uh, absorption uh, varies in different types of animals. The different parts of the earth have different ratios of carbon-12 to carbon-14, and they varied over time. Yeah, so they yeah. have to carefully carefully correlate the, the sample uh, to known things. And then even then, it only gives an approximate date range. It doesn't you know, it doesn't say this was written in the year 632. It says this was written somewhere between the year 600 and 700. And that and could be like 100 years of a difference. And that makes a huge difference when we're trying to get price, precise date. Yeah. 
So people who actually look at the dating of ancient documents rely much more heavily on looking at the handwriting and comparing it to samples that were known to be ran in a specific year than they do rely on carbon dating because it's, you know, the, the handwriting is at least gives a, a similar date range, yeah, yeah. but it, it's pretty much definitive. Whereas the carbon dating, you have all kinds of question marks. Did the sample get contaminated? Did they write on an old piece of paper? You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. 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 That's, so that's me, definitely is a much more reliable uh, method looking at the handwriting. Yeah. So let me contrast uh, what we've seen about the early leaders of so-called Islam to the early leaders of Christianity. So uh, our earliest sources for Christian leaders actually are found in the Bible. Even the most atheist skeptical scholars accept that some of the letters written by Paul were definitely written by him. And these ones are the ones that were written in the, the 40s and the 50s. And in these texts, so we're already talking about um, pretty close to the time of, of Jesus. And of course, every Muslim will already know that Paul supports a very clear picture of uh, Jesus being God because they have to try to blame Paul for corrupting the message of Jesus. So, you know, these are very early, but it's even worse than, well, worse for Muslims, better for Christians than most Muslims realize because the Pauline letters, it preserves several hymns, uh, early songs sung by Christians uh, about their beliefs that most scholars agree predate Paul. Now, Paul converted to Christianity only three years after the death of Jesus. So we're talking about material that was probably being circulated in some form by th within three years of wow. Jesus' death. Yeah. So I'm just going to look at one of those hymns real quick. Uh, this is Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not equate equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every name should bow, heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord, to the glory of God the Father. So if we look at this, it looks like it's painting a very delicate picture, balancing the humanity and the divinity of Jesus. Uh, it says he was in the form of God, but then he emptied himself and he took on the form of a servant which is a human being so it's saying you know he was god he in some form uh did something that allowed him to become a human being so basically it's painting the same delicate balance that we have today of understanding that jesus is fully man but he's also fully god yeah it also teaches the the lordship of jesus and it teaches his eternal authority. You know, this is definitely not something that a Muslim could look up and look at and say, yeah, I believe that about Jesus too. <laughs> so yeah. if, if we turn to works outside the Bible, we pretty much have continuous record of things. So the, the writings of the Bible were perhaps completed around the year 70, or if you're a taking a more skeptical view around the end of the first century. And then we have other writings from that didn't make it into the Bible um, from early Christian leaders picking up right from around that same time period, the 70s, 80s, 90s. We have numerous sources from the early second century. Just to name some of these, we have Epistle of Clement, Epistle of Barnabas, several letters from Ignatius. We have fragments of Papias's commentary on the Gospels. Um, we have a letter from Polycarp, and we have the Didache, or Teaching of the Twelve. This is an early catechism of the Christian Church. And for, for those who don't know, 
catechism is basically an instruction manual for new believers. Uh, it, it tells them how to do various things. Actually, just on, um, you mentioned Papi, uh, Papias, Bishop Papias. Um, he actually tells us about how Mark's gospel was written. He says that Mark was disciple of Peter and and uh, Peter recounted his stories. And so essentially, Mark's gospel is a memoir of St. Peter. And that's quite yes. an interesting detail. And he said that it wasn't necessarily in order, but he didn't put in anything that he wasn't sure of. And he tried not to leave anything out that was important. You know, and that's a good, you know, close to the time sort of... Uh, vouch for the Mark's Gospel's veracity, you know? Yes, and uh, he also writes about how some of the other Gospels came about. Recently, I've had several discussions with Muslims that say, uh, well, the Hadith re literature is reliable because we have the chain of narration, so we know that these stories were passed down from so-and-so to so-and-so and so-and-so. Well, one, you don't actually know that. Anyone could make up that chain of narration uh, because we don't have the writings of, you know, the person, the second back in the chain or the third back in the chain or anyone in the chain. All we have is the, the final form. But then like, then this is way different than the way the gospel. You have no clue how they came about. <laughs> but actually, Papias says that he spent time talking to the apostles that he um, wanted to get the authentic story. And he was himself a disciple of John. Oh, well, he says John the Elder, which there's some debate whether that is the Apostle John or that is uh, someone who was the disciple of John, who was also named John. But either way, and then we have other people who learn from Papias, and we have their writings, and then we have people who learn from them, and we have their writings. So we have a chain of narration. Yeah, absolutely. Not, not, that, not that the that chain is any anything special but we do have that chain and we actually have each step of it whereas the muslims yeah. are just like oh we have this chain on here and we believe it i'm like mm, it could just be made yeah. up well, like the the chain from uh irenaeus back to saint john is incredible like true just two steps polycarp to john and the you know the theology of, of both of them is very strongly suggesting jesus divinity you know so there's yes. no there is no doubt. So Paul isn't really needed. Like if, if, if Muslims want to throw St. Paul under the bus, well, John is teaching the same message. Jesus died. Jesus rose again. Jesus ascended. You know, Jesus, son of God. You know, it's the same message. It might be packaged yep. slightly different by, by Paul, but it's the same message. Absolutely. So all these writings that I, I've listed, they do, they do some interesting things. One, they all quote New Testament passages as scripture. This is remarkable because, you know, the, the canon wasn't fully formed yet at this point, and everyone believed in the Old Testament, and they believed the Old Testament testified about Jesus. But here are these early Christians already quoting books that made it into the Bible in the New Testament, and they're tr treating them as if they are scripture on the same authority as the Old Testament writings. They also all affirm numerous aspects of Christian theology. They don't contradict any major doctrine of the church. So in short, there's strong evidence that what we believe today is the same as what these earliest Christians believe. And there aren't any writings from this time period that say anyone believed, talked about anyone who believed in a non-divine uh, or Muslim Jesus I just have a few quotes from these sources. I'm not going to go through all of them. There's tons and tons of material. But just to illustrate the point, I have a couple quotes. First one's from the Didachi. It says, Concerning baptism, baptize thus, having first rehearsed all these things, baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost in running water. What If you don't have any running water, baptize in other water. And if you don't have cold water, then warm. But if you have neither of these, pour water three times on the head, saying, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So this is basically the same baptism practice we have today. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. From the writings of Clements, he says, the apostles have preached the gospel to us from the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's already aware of the gospel message. And then he says, 
And love has the Lord taken us to himself on account of the love he bore us. Jesus Christ, our Lord, gave his blood for us by the will of God, his flesh for our flesh and his soul for our souls. So here we see the atoning sacrifice of Jesus already clearly explained in an early writing. From the writings of Polycarp. Now may the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and the eternal high priest himself, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, build you up in faith and truth, and to us with you and all those under heaven who will yet believe in our Lord and God, Jesus Christ, and in his Father who raised him from the dead. So here we have Polycarp clearly saying that Jesus is God yeah. and that he was raised from the dead. And then one more from the writings of Ignatius. Consequently, all magic and every kind of spell were dissolved. The ignorance so characteristic of the wicked vanished, and the ancient kingdom was abolished when God appeared in human form to bring the newness of eternal life. Elsewhere he says, For our God, Jesus Christ, was conceived by Mary according to God's plan, both from the seed of David and of the Holy Spirit. Wow, our God, Jesus Christ, you couldn't get clearer than that. Yeah. That's so, from uh, he, what time? That's, is that first century or just early second century? Uh, so Ignatius wrote a number of letters in about 110 or so. Okay, uh, yeah. So that would be about 80 years after the time of Jesus. Yeah, um, yeah. He wrote these letters as he was himself on the way to become a martyr yeah, for the faith. Yeah. yeah. One other thing I would say, these early church fathers, as they refer to, from the time, I, I can't remember which you said was the very first one, but all the way to John of Damascus in the 7th century, 8th century. An awful lot of them were like guard dogs. If anyone produced a heresy, they would devote every ounce of energy to destroying those heresies and defending the truth. So like, there wasn't a chance of anyone distorting the gospel message because the, these guys were committed to preserving the truth because for them, the gospel was a record of Jesus himself, and they, they, they would not betray Jesus in that way by by neglecting that duty. Absolutely. A number of the writings that have come down to us are basically just compilations of every heresy that had been known up to that present time and explanations of why it was a heresy. The interesting thing for Muslims is that these early heresies almost always die, denied the humanity of Jesus. They didn't deny the divinity. They thought Jesus was divine. They just didn't accept that he was also a man. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Which is definitely not the Muslim story that uh, Jesus was just a man and early Christians believed he was just a man and then later divinity was added. If anything... Divinity was the highly emphasized, and humanity would, took a, a back seat in the early writings. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Very interesting. Uh, so to summarize, uh, we have material that dates within a couple years of Jesus' death. We have letters by numerous church leaders, both within the canonical, got, canonical New Testament and outside the New Testament, that pretty much run continuously from the 40s. I looked up, up until about 1.30, uh, I, uh, within the first 100 years, but then they continue on after that. There's never any gaps in the history. These early writings, they all, most of these early church leaders ended up going to their own deaths for reclaiming the, the gospel of Jesus. And we even have heretics uh, that were implicitly acknowledging that the canonical scripture was well established. If you look at a lot of these later writings, they tend to try to fill in gaps in the story. Like, you know, there's lots of stories about what Jesus did in his youth. And, the, you know, they, they, they say, well, we don't know what happened between this port. Let's put something in there. And they only cover enough of the same material to make it clear that it's a, uh, you know, that it's a gospel account. So basically, these her writings that are written by heretics, that are written much later than the gospels, they're, they already understand that people accept the gospels as canonical. And they're saying, well, we need a place to put our material. Let's put it in the gaps. Let, let's make it 
the youthful Jesus say these things, like that yeah. kind of thing. It's it seems like a, a parasitical relationship between these writings and the gospels. It's not they're not on their own standing on their own feet, if you like, you know. Right. I mean, people so, often say, well, what about all the, the material that was left out of the New Testament? And I say, have you read it? Because <laughs> you obviously have it. it, it <laughs> it's pretty clearly self-defeating most of the time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, a couple of other things just just before you move on. Um, there's a couple of historical bits of evidence of, for Pontius Pilate. Um, there was a stone slab found off the coast of Israel um, with his name on it. And there was also a ring found with his his imprint uh, recently. Well, at least it came into the news a few years ago. So, yeah, there's all kinds of like... there's all kinds of archaeological confirmation for details of the the gospel accounts, which speaks to their authenticity. Obviously, archaeology can never prove that Jesus was God incarnate, but it can prove that the writers of the story were familiar with the first century, that they knew they really lived in that time. They really started the message in this time, which is really hard to explain if everyone knew that Jesus had died on the cross. Like I said earlier, this is really humiliating death. This is not the way that new movements were formed. They're not formed by people being put to death. So, that, you know, that's a pretty strong indication that something happened. And even skeptics realize this because they, they usually refuse to offer any explanation as to what happened. They just say, I don't know what happened, but it definitely wasn't that Jesus rose from the dead because we know that's impossible. Yeah, yeah. But do we know that's impossible? I don't think <laughs> we do. <laughs> yeah. I think one one thing I would say as well is that if you compare any of the Hadiths with any of the passages in the Gospels, the Hadiths are so lacking in detail, whereas the Gospels go into great detail. Like if you, for example, take passage from someone like St. Luke, like the detail is, is incredible. And yes, it still has a flavor of conciseness about it, but you really, you can feel that you're there and it feels real. Whereas the Hadiths are like, like they're set in a cardboard box. You know, it's a scene is so blank. You can't smell the roses in, in the Hadiths, you know, it's, it's, it's very bare bones. Yeah. Absolutely. So just to give a like a two cents summary of the evidence I covered in this section, and, you know, basically there's no time for development of doctrine. This is what the earliest Christians believe. You can accept it or you can reject it, but you can't say that it was development. You can't say it was corruption. You can't say someone changed it. We have all the the physical evidence that shows that this is what the earliest Christians believed. So now, uh, why don't you give us an outline of what you think? really gave rise to Islam. Keeping in mind that our evidence is pretty minimal, so that the conclusion is going to be speculative, but what's your best guess? Yeah, so my idea is that Muhammad it was like an empty shell on which um, a biography was placed. He was largely forgotten. There were some traditions that came down the line, but from the sources, we get the impression that he was just a, a, a religious I won't say fanatic, but a religious pr preacher that lent very heavily on Jewish and Christian traditions. Um, but he wasn't very well known, and the people associated with him don't seem to have um, said much about him after his death. And I think the key person is um, Azubair in the 685 and, and onwards. Um, he seems to be uh, Muhammad's fanboy. Maybe he was uh, nostalgic for the time of, of the original expansion. But he invests an awful lot into this Muhammad person. It could be that he is instrumental in, in some of the writings of the Quran, but that's, it's hard to prove that. Certainly, al Hajjaz is said, according to some uh, Muslim sources, to be the collector of the Quran. So in Islamic um, hadiths, we have three uh, versions of who collected the Quran. We have um, Abu Bakr, we have Uthman, and we have um, Hajaz. So take your pick. I'm sort of take my pick with Hajaz in the 690s because prior to that, there's no mention of the Quran. So essentially, that's that's how it started. And then when we move on from the Umayyads to the Abbasids, things go crazy because um, first of all, the Hadiths are being written to support the Islamic laws. And the people who were writing the 
Hadiths tend to be either ex-slaves or descendants of slaves, and they have everything to gain from making up these stories. If they become religious experts, they can bypass the tribal system and get to the top of the social ladder. And so there was a huge incentive. So if you look at say, the top 10 people connected with Hadith writing, you'll see a very strong pattern of that. So that's, that's, my, that's my impression at this point in time. Excellent. Very good. And one thing I, I want to point out with that is our first hints of credible evidence for modern Islam is no earlier than 690. And we don't really have any Islamic material before that. Really, we don't have any Islamic material of any substance before uh, 750. And probably what happened, and this is obviously speculation, we have no way of proving it, but probably what happened is one of two things. Either in the various civil wars, all of the old material was destroyed, you know, not intentionally, just accidentally. It was destroyed. They're involved in civil wars. Writing was obviously very rare. Um, what little writing there was was destroyed. Or the other possibility is that someone went back and they're like, oh, this doesn't agree. While we're in control now, we... We need to have a cohesive narrative that supports our leadership. So let's just get rid of that material. Yeah, yeah. So I would like to close uh, the program by summarizing the evidence for the truth of Christianity. You know, very briefly, obviously. We have good reason to believe that the canonical Gospels were written in the 60s or 50s. We have good reason to believe that they have connection to eyewitness accounts. There's extensive details within the accounts that a later writer couldn't invent. There's also not this I concept of historical fiction. In the ancient world, people either wrote clear fiction or wrote clear history. Now, I'm not saying they always got every detail right, but you know, they either intentionally wrote history or they intentionally wrote fiction. They didn't try to write something that was uh, looked like history, but everyone knew as fiction. So all these incidental details paint a really strong picture of connection to original eyewitnesses of Jesus. We have that he made, clearly made a huge mark on society in a very short amount of time that he was put to death in um, the most embarrassing criminal fashion possible. This should have invalidated any claim to being the Messiah in the Jewish mind. No Jew would have believed that the Messiah was going to be put to death. And even atheists agree that the de Jesus' death by crucifixion is one of the most certain facts about ancient history, and that already by itself contradicts the Quran. And then, for no apparent reason, three days after Jesus died, people started to proclaim that they had seen him alive again. I didn't go into the evidence, but we have really strong evidence that this as well dates back to before Paul's time, that basically this has been the message from the beginning, that God became incarnate in the person of Jesus. He worked a ministry for three years. He died on the cross for the atonement of sins, and then he rose again from the dead on the third day, giving us also the promise of eternal life. So this is a really strong case. I only covered the tiny fraction of the evidence we have for Christianity today. And most critics, uh, at least ones that consider themselves intellectually honest, won't even bother to offer an explanation for the rise of Christianity. And that's for a good reason. It's because it would require the collision of a whole bunch of highly improbable, unrelated coincidences. Jesus has to draw this big following. He has to somehow get himself put to death. He has His body has to disappear. People have to start seeing what they believe to be his resurrected body. These appearances have to convert, convince skeptics. For example, the Apostle Paul, 
uh, was persecuting Christians by his own admission before he converted. It's just not plausible that someone who never believed in Jesus and, in fact, was highly hostile to Christianity would have a hallucination of a risen Jesus and convert to Christianity. So instead, uh, what critics do is they just say, well, this doesn't prove anything. You can't really know anything about history anyway. Or they try to find some minor error in one of the gospel accounts, what they think is some minor error in one of the gospel accounts. And they're like, oh, see, the author made a mistake here. That means that uh, he's not reliable and you can't believe anything he says. He's just making it up, which is not how history's done. If you look at, at secular history, every secular historian makes errors. I mean, they're human beings. They make errors. What historians don't do is say, well, that guy made an error. I'll just throw it out. If they did, we would know nothing about history, basically. There's very little that can be reconstructed from archaeology. Basically, our understanding of history comes from written documents. Yeah. Uh, so when we look for the evidence of Christianity, just applying a normal historical method, uh, the case is really, really strong. And anyone watching today owes it to themselves to seriously consider the evidence. Both okay. the poor documentation of Islamic history, the poor correlation of what we do know about Islamic history and what you've been taught in the traditional history, and also the strong rec documentation for Jesus's life and early Christianity teaching exactly the same message as modern Christianity, and the difficulty of explaining the origins of Christianity in the face of uh, a dead leader and extreme hostility. Yeah. Before we close out, is there anything you'd like to add? Um, yeah, just two throwaway ideas. Muslims might uh, say, well, you know, Muhammad destroyed idols in, in uh, Mecca. Um, I just want to point out, you know, we, we, we've already mentioned that Petra is where, where Islam began, but in 423, there was a monk with 40 companions called Marsama, and he destroyed the idols in, in Petra. So <laughs> there were no idols to destroy. It was done 200 years before, and clearly they borrowed this idea. Now, he was considered a, a great saint in Petra. So we see here a borrowing of uh, an ancient person and placed on, on Muhammad. Another thing that, um, is the Battle of the Trench. We hear Muslims on about the Battle of the Trench, Battle of the Trench. Well, the original Battle of the Trench was in 530. It's the Battle of Dara. It was between the Byzantines and the Sass, uh, Sassanians. And that was the original Battle of the Trench. The, you know, so there's incredible amounts of borrowing in uh, the Islamic literature. So take it all with a pinch of salt is my advice. Uh, just throw it out there real quick. Muslims, it seems to be their favorite defense, pretty much their only defense of uh, Petra not being the original site of the origins of Islam is that, well, the Zamzam well is located in Mecca, so it has to be in Mecca. Were there wells in Petra? <laughs> so, sorry, I didn't hear you there. So, uh, so my question is, uh, were there mel wells in Petra? <laughs> That's the thing, yeah. Well, we can we can certainly say that there was uh, cisterns there, and actually the Arabic word for well is the same as the Arabic word for cistern. So I think, you know, there's a lot of confusion between things like that. But anyway, that's probably enough for today. Yeah. Well, plus common sense. I mean, if people are yeah. living in an area, they obviously have a source of water. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Being a source of water in Mecca hardly proves anything. Yeah. All right. So uh, thank you, everyone, for watching today. I know we've gone pretty long. So if you made it this far, congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> uh, be sure to <laughs> uh, be sure to subscribe to my channel and also Sneakers Corner. He does uh, a lot of interesting videos on the history of Islam. He's especially interested in the origins. And, you know, he's not afraid to change his mind. So if you have good evidence that says he's wrong, just let him know. And I will change my mind. How many times have I changed my mind over the past few months? <laughs> uh, so I'll put a link to his channel in the video description. I'll have another video out within a week that will be looking at unicorns in the Bible. Yeah, so I'm looking forward to that one. Uh, if you want to see more discussions between Mel and myself in the future, just let us know in the comments. And, and actually, again. And actually, perhaps you could leave us a note about what you'd like us to talk about. That would be good. 
Yeah, definitely. Let us know what you want us to discuss. We have a lot of knowledge and it's hard to know what is interesting to people and what is just interesting to only to us. <laughs> so let us know what you want to see.